It's time for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour, brought to you every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. A presentation of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company, maker of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world honored Longines. Good evening, this is Frank Knight. May I introduce our co-editors for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope. Mr. William Bradford Huey, author and analyst, and Dr. William Peterson, author and economist. Our distinguished guest for this evening is the Honorable Laurie C. Battle, United States Congressman from Alabama. Mr. Battle, many of our viewers, of course, know that you're now serving your fourth term in Congress, that you're one of the more uh, distinguished younger southern congressman, that you had uh, a distinguished war record, and that you've interested yourself particularly in our foreign affairs, and that you're a member of the Foreign Affairs Committee. Now, first of all, sir, on in relation to the administration program to reduce arms expenditures, it's believed that the Democratic Party and the Democratic members of Congress may oppose the administration for the first time uh, in its efforts now to reduce arms <coughs> expenditures. Now, what about yourself, sir? Do, uh, do you expect to oppose the general effort on the part of the administration to reduce arms expenditures? Well, first, uh, Mr. Huey, let me thank you for your very kind introduction. It's a privilege to be on this great program and to have the opportunity of saying hello to the folks and especially my constituents in Jefferson County, Alabama. As to your question, I personally will oppose this $5 billion reduction uh, in our military expenditures. I think it was a tragic mistake and it was proven back in Secretary Johnson's, Johnson's administration when they cut to the peril point. Well, now, do you believe that it will become a party issue that the Democrats generally will oppose the reduction in arms? Well, of course, I don't believe that we can expect the Democrats to support the Republican president forever, but I hope this will not become a party measure, a party issue, well, because Mr. Battle, uh, it's just you, too important. Mr. Battle, would you say the Air Force represents our chief striking weapon to prosecute the war in Korea? Well, I would not underestimate the effectiveness of our striking air force for one minute. I think it's most important and I would sincerely and honestly with conviction oppose the anticipated cuts. Well now, uh, specifically on that, on that cut, uh, it's, it's proposed to cut the air force by five billion dollars and uh, do you think that this would uh, seriously impair the Air Force, this, this cut? Well, it's my understanding that it would cause something of a stretch out. In other words, instead of being prepared here in the next couple of years with a few more, a uh, lot more planes and a greater striking force, that it would extend it on to a further period of time, and I don't think that's safe. What about your belief as far as your constituents are concerned? Do you believe that, the, that your constituents and the American people are willing to continue spending these vast amounts of money on Well, arms. I'm certain that my constituents want to cut out all fat and waste and uh, economize wherever is possible, but not to the detriment of our security. Well, now, and, and specifically again, do you believe that most or much of this $5 billion proposed cut will be restored by the Congress? Well, I believe that most of it will be restored by the Congress, and I certainly hope so, because I don't think that we can afford to go through the dangerous period that we have before unprepared. Well, moving on to something that you have been uh, particularly interested in, sir, you are author of what is known as the Battle Act. Now, will you explain briefly to our viewers what the Battle Act uh, well, intended to do? Well, the Battle Act is Public Law 213 of the 82nd Congress. It had two purposes, one to establish a policy for the United States. In other words, embargoing the trade of war materials and strategic materials and preventing them from going behind the Iron Curtain. It had for a second purpose, uh, the prevention of those same uh, materials from going from our allies behind the Iron Curtain to build up these communist war machines. In other words, its, it's specific purpose was to prevent our enemy from receiving anything that might be useful in the war against us. That's exactly right. And we said that all military, economic, and financial aid would be cut off from any of our recipients 
if they didn't follow that same policy. Now, have you made a particular study uh, since the passage of that act? Have you made it your business to, to examine and see whether or not they were, the provisions were being carried out? I certainly have. Uh, last fall, for instance, I visited many of the highly industrialized European nations and with particular this particular thing in mind. Well, Mr. Barrow, how do you reconcile your position with that of Senator McCarthy? Uh, as I understand that Senator McCarthy is to stop all aid, in other words, all shipments, foreign shipments going into China. Well, what we've done in this legislation, and I think we could still go further, is to embargo completely all war materials, that is, arms, ammunition, implements of war, and thank goodness, according to our best intelligence, no recipient of our aid has sent any war materials as such in this uh, limited definition. And then we go further and say that all strategic materials will be embargoed, but the President of the United States in an exceptional case where he has determined that it's to the security interest of the United States can make an exception. You remember the Danish tanker. And uh, the way I would broaden this is to include in this list things like rubber and certain types of ball bearings and vehicles and a whole host of items that are useful to the enemy that well, uh, is not now on this embargo list. Well, from your extensive information, sir, will you tell our viewers whether or not you think that our enemy has received substantial aid from our allies during the last three years? Well, I'm sorry to say, Mr. Hewitt, that I am convinced in my own mind and from personal observation that they have received substantial aid from our allies. Then you would probably mm. say that this is one of the primary reasons for the big three meeting between uh, Mr. Churchill and... Uh, President Eisenhower, Mr. Blank, whoever he's going to be. Uh, Dr. Peterson, I'm certain that this <coughs> issue will be brought up because it's a um, dividing point between us at the present time, especially the difference between Great Britain's policy and ours. Well, now, uh, Britain is now sending uh, rubber, for instance, to Russia. Uh, and Russia is not uh, our enemy, or at least our avowed enemy in Korea. What do you think about Britain's policy of sending rubber to Russia? Would you attempt to cut that off? Well, so far as I'm concerned, it don't make sense to continue sending military aid to our allies if they're going to continue to help the build up of the communist war machine, not only in China, but in Russia and all of the satellite countries. For instance, Great Britain has a policy of not sending rubber to China, but she sends it to Russia where it can be converted into tires and then sent on uh, behind the Iron Curtain wherever she may choose, even to the battlefront. And I think that rubber should be classified as strategic and embargoed. Well, now, what do you think about the future? In the future, do you think we have a pretty good chance of, of cutting off these materials that are going to all Iron Curtain countries? Well, I think very definitely. Of course, the main problem is one of enforcement and cooperation. But I think very definitely that we can expand these lists and uh, go much further and accomplish a whole lot more uh, to prevent the buildup of the war machine uh, for, uh, coming from items that originate in the West. Well, now, in these efforts to, to cut off uh, trade with our enemy, uh, you, of course, we run into the question now of uh, also uh, our efforts to increase trade uh, in the world. Now, you come from the South, which has traditionally supported a free trade policy. Uh, do you support uh, generally the idea of more world trade? Um, I certainly do, and as a matter of fact, I will support the reciprocal trade policy that the President has asked us to extend. While at the same time, that does not apply to these materials that we are talking about, and I don't think that we can continuously and forever uh, deplete our resources without taking things back in to our own country. Well, Mr. Battle, with particular reference to the importation of oil, particularly from South America, you're coming from a coal-producing uh, district. How do you feel about foreign oil? Well, I used to think that this slogan of trade and not aid was about the only non-controversial issue in my district, but I found recently that not only the coal operators, but the union operators have gotten together for a change, and they have asked me to support the Simpson bill, which would limit the amount of import of oil. 
I think, of course, that we must be reasonable about the proposition and at the same time realize, for instance, that all that would come from Venezuela is, is, uh, is, is an important thing because we're, gonna, we're going in our district, in our own area, to import uh, iron ore from Venezuela. Uh, you mean the Birmingham district is now importing uh, iron ore from Venezuela? They have a very rich source of ores, and we are going to in import them through the Port of Mobile to help out in our industries and therefore preserve our resources for a longer period of time. So I believe in protecting our industries, but at the same time being reasonable. Well, as a final question, Mr. Battle, coming back to all of this extensive experience that you've had in dealing with our allies in reference to the war in Korea. Now, a great many of our viewers are a little bit disillusioned about some of our allies and the amount of cooperation that they've given us. Uh, from your experience, sir, uh, do you believe that it's, uh, it's possible for us to get a higher degree of cooperation from our allies? Mr. Huey, I have no doubt in my own mind that we can and that we will get a higher degree of cooperation from our allies. We've got a lot to build on. For instance, in Turkey, I know from first-hand experience, or I just felt, that Turkey would fight to the last man in case you were invaded or in case the West was invaded. It's up to you, the United States of America. The challenge is ours. We will not fail, I believe, with the proper and firm leadership that we can and will give that our allies will come along and we will defeat the communists. Well, thank you, sir, for these uh, very firm expressions of yours this evening. Thank you. The opinions you've heard our speakers express tonight have been entirely their own. The editorial board for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope was Mr. William Bradford Huey and Dr. William Peterson. Our distinguished guest was the Honorable Laurie C. Battle, United States Congressman from Alabama. The reputation of Longines watches for greater accuracy has brought many requests over the years for specialized Longine watches for scientific purposes, for navigation, aviation, astronomy, exploration, sports science, and so on. Now here are some of these Longine technical watches. Many are of complicated design. Each was designed by Longine engineers made in the Longine factory. The exceptional skill, experience, and inventiveness so often demonstrated by Longine watchmakers serves to explain why, among the world's finest watches, Longines alone has won 10 World's Fair grand prizes, 28 gold medals, and so many honors for accuracy. Now this same skill, experience, and inventiveness is evident in every Longines watch now being shown by your authorized jeweler agency. These Longines watches have more than commanding beauty. They represent close to ultimate perfection in watch manufacture. So whatever the gift occasion, whether for the bride and groom, to celebrate a happy anniversary or for a birthday or graduation throughout the world. No other name on a watch means so much as Longines, the world's most honored watch, the world's most honored gift, premier product of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company. Since 1866, maker of watches of the highest character. We invite you to join us every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday evening at this same time for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour, broadcast on behalf of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world-honored Longines. This is Frank Knight, reminding you that Longines and Whitnor watches are sold and serviced from coast to coast by more than 4,000 leading jewelers who proudly display this emblem, Agency for Longines Whitnor Watches. There's Sunday Daytime Adventure on the CBS Television Network.